All right, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the Envision Utah Quality Communities Academy. We've uh, done this for three years now, um, where we like to talk about uh, topics that are relevant to communities throughout Utah, thinking about how to uh, make sure that even as we grow, we have a high quality of life for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on uh, mixed use centers. Uh, my, my name is a little touch. My name is Ari Bruning. Um, I'm the uh, president and CEO of Envision Utah and excited to have our uh, slate of panelists here today to talk to us. And I uh, need to start first by thanking our sponsors of this event. We couldn't do this without them. Um, so Daybreak Communities and Rocky Mountain Power have both uh, stepped up to sponsor this. And today we will hear from uh, a number of folks. Again, I'm Ari Bruning and then we'll hear from uh, Ted Knowlton, who's the deputy director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council, followed by Michaela uh, Respicio Evans, Envision Utah, and then Megan Townsend, Paul Allred, Stephen James, and Randy Woodbury. And I'll introduce each of them as we go. So a uh, little bit of an uh, introduction here. Uh, we at Envision Utah, we're a, a, a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around for 23 years now, and we were started in the late 90s by a group of concerned citizens, um, everybody from the governor, Mike Levitt, to uh, Larry H. Miller, and so forth. Uh, to look at uh, how we grow uh, and how, how we can make sure we maintain a high quality of life even as we grow. Um, and today, the, the reason we're gonna be talking about mixed use centers today as we, as we think about quality communities uh, dates back probably even earlier than the, this, but in 2015, we uh, did a statewide visioning process we called Your Utah, Your Future, where we put together uh, four different scenarios for how we could grow in Utah and brought those to the public and over 50,000 people responded and 80% chose one scenario and that scenario was one that had mixed use centers throughout our communities. So we're going to talk more about what that means and, and why Utahns wanted that for their future. 80% is, it's hard to get 80% of Utahns to agree on anything. So if you think about mixed use centers, um, this is not a new or novel concept. The, these are the kinds of places that we've built historically. Our pioneer communities uh, generally all had a walkable main street type of area. Um, so this is kind of about recapturing the best of our past. Um, personally, I live in Daybreak and we're gonna hear a little bit about Daybreak later. Um, but this uh, little bakery here, I can send my nine-year-old little boy to the bakery here to get a cupcake or an ice cream cone on foot and not worry about his safety. And those are the kinds of places we're talking about today when we think about a mixed-use center. And they're the kinds of places that we're seeing more and more demand for. Um, this, this is a survey we did in Utah County recently asking people what their ideal community is to live in. And you'll see, first of all, that uh, people have a wide variety of preferences. Um, about 50% in the blue colors there shows something pretty akin to a traditional suburb. Um, you have another 8% who chose a small town. The other 42% chose a place a little more walkable, a little more uh, mixed use, and we'll define what mixed use means in a minute here. Um, you know, a place, maybe it's a place like Daybreak, maybe it's a place like a downtown Salt Lake City or Provo, um, or maybe it's more like the avenues. But that 42%, that's a large number who are asking for these kinds of places to live in. So with that, um, I'm gonna, well, before I turn the time over to Ted, a uh, few notes about uh, how this webinar will proceed. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A option. And so if you have questions as we go, you can type in your question. And at the end here, we'll address as many of those as we can. And there's also a little uh, chat function and you can chat with, any or all of the panelists as well, and we'll try to respond to that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna let Ted Knowlton uh, say a few words. Ted is the Deputy Director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council, um, which uh, represents the uh, cities and counties uh, from uh, Brigham City to Bluffdale, essentially. And he's also the President of the Utah Chapter of the American Planning Association. So Ted. Okay, thanks so much, Ari. And it's uh, great to be with you, everybody. Um, I hope you are enjoying your um, uh, time at home logging into a, an event like this. Um, you can think of me as the 
the waiter who fills your water and, and make sure you have a napkin before we dig into the, the meal of uh, the presentations that follow. So I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes. Now, um, communities are constantly thinking about questions like, how do we have high quality development, high quality offices, retail spaces, housing? Um, you're gonna hear a lot about what centers are, why centers are good. You're gonna hear a little bit about how to make them happen. And I wanna leave you with one key point, which is that where centers occur and where those different land uses, offices, retail, housing, where matters. Um, I even have a, a hashtag, which my children, are both proud and recoil when I use hashtags, hashtag where matters. Um, and so you can think of, this is Leighton, Leighton with uh, a piece of land, um, UTA planned a front runner station, and they thought this is a where, this is a location where if we bring these things together, a real synergy could happen. We could create a special place. We could create identity and uh, a heart to our community. This is my city, North Salt Lake City. I'm a planning commissioner in this town and ma many of you might be planning commissioners. Now think of the where of this question. A lot of communities are asking the question, hey, uh, you know, if we, if we don't meet lower, if we don't allow the market, the private market to meet the um, housing needs of lower income Utahns, it's fine, they'll just go to another location. That where matters a lot to those households. So um, part of the where matters question is the value of the where being found in your community. So North Salt Lake, it, right at the intersection of these two major roads thought, maybe this is a place where we can bring this mix of uses, including allowing the market to meet housing needs to gather into a center. And they started with their general plan. They developed a detailed plan for this area. They worked on the zoning. They got some buildings approved. And you're looking at an in, under construction building that includes office, retail, and housing. Now this is a where matters. What this means is uh, the households that live there, they can access employment in downtown Salt Lake City very easily, much more easily than if they had to drive out further to another location. It also means that they brought those pieces together into something that becomes walkable and they created that magic. And lastly, the where mattered here because they brought those things together in a location where a future bus rapid transit station would be. So where mattered a lot. There was strategy with regard to location. And that's the one key point I'd like to leave you with. Um, now, uh, many of you might be familiar with the American Planning Association, Utah. I just wanna make a basic pitch for that, which is that it's an organization that uh, represents the planners in Utah. You can learn about it by going to apautah.org. We also represent and uh, provide training materials uh, materials and tools and ideas for elected officials and appointed officials. And it's very, very inexpensive to join if you are a planning commissioner. And so with that, I hope that you all have your napkins and I have filled your beverage and I will turn the, the, the baton back to Ari. Ari, take it away. All right. Thanks, Ted. Um... Before we dive into our next speaker here, uh, we wanted to put up a little polling question here asking you how you heard about this event. So you should be able to just click on your screen and uh, we'll all be able to see the results to see how everyone got here. So far it's looking like emails, the, the winner. Give you about uh, Eight more seconds here to vote. All right, let's close it. Yeah, so it looks like about three quarters of you got here through email um, and then personal invite 
are the top two ways we got here. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to turn the time now to uh, Michaela Respicio. She is a uh, associate planner here at Envision Utah, and she's going to talk through um, the background and history of centers and a little bit about what a center is. So, Michaela. Great, thanks, Ari. So, let me get my slides up. Can everyone see that okay? Is it? I don't know. Great. So, thank you, Ari, for the presentation. Um, for the introduction, the first thing that I want to talk about um, is something that we all see and feel every day in Utah, and that is growth. Over the last few decades, our uh, Utah's rapidly growing population has exacerbated a lot of problems like traffic, air quality, housing affordability, and many others. Um, and then looking forward, we know that Cam C. Gardner has estimated that Utah's population will grow by a further 1.5 million people by 2050. So a question on a lot of our minds is, where will these people live? Where will they work? Where will they go to school? And where will they recreate? And then the second trend that I wanna talk about really quickly is the ever-changing COVID-19 situation. So thank you to WFRC for these numbers. Um, they, they did some data tracking on trips so here we see the, some numbers for what, at the peak of Utah's stay at home phase, uh, how travel was affected. So we see some, I think, predictable numbers as far as e-commerce and telecommuting went up um, and driving went down. Now this next slide are postulates for what the new normal could be two to five years after COVID-19. And we see that many of these trends that we're seeing now could be here to stay, albeit maybe a little bit in a less extreme way. Um, but we're seeing that there may be uh, more people spending time at home and doing less driving and an increase in demand for um, open space and a whole new population, a whole new generation of cyclists that have come out of this um, crisis, really. So as far as the legacy of COVID-19, there's some implications here for planning. Um, some being a decrease in retail and office space in our cities, um, and then convert as that corresponds to less parking needs and less peak hour congestion as people are now have not having to make their daily commutes. Um, but I think a really big thing that we might be seeing is more flexibility for certain segments of the population to choose where they live since they're not going to be tethered to a daily commute or a local service. Um, and we also could potentially see a demand for more open space and food options in traditionally suburban neighborhoods, which may mean more demand for places like centers. So I'm going to start off with a broad definition here. A center is a place in a region, city, or neighborhood that provides amenities and services to the surrounding community. Um, and I know many things fit into that category, but centers really follow three main, uh, have three main characteristics. The first being that they are mixed use, um, as both Ari and Ted have touched on. Centers have housing, office, retail, civic uses, open, open space, et cetera, to help create a dynamic and appealing place. Um, and the most important of these would be is housing to ensure that people can live nearby and destinations are easily accessible. And this is also a way um, to combat some of the housing affordability and provide some much needed supply of housing along the Wasatch Front. The second quality is good access to regional transportation. I think the last thing that we want to do is create an attractive place and make it hard to get to. Um, we don't want centers to be placed to be sources of traffic, so it's very important that we ensure that people can move efficiently into, out of, and within the center. Um, centers also support tra uh, public transportation, cycling, and walking in addition to vehicle transportation. And the third quality, the last major quality would be that it's walkable and human scale. And this is what really makes your space welcoming and memorable to people. It's the ability to explore and be able to feel engaged by your surroundings. And it's this on the ground experience that gives your center the opportunity to really be unique. So here's an example of, uh, just put up some pictures of some of our most loved centers in Utah. And you see on the top left, we have downtown Provo, top right is downtown Salt Lake and Holiday Village at the bottom. And as you can see, these places are beautiful. They're places that you wanna be. And they're some of our most loved in Utah. 
So I know I started off with a really broad definition, so I also want to touch on what a center is not. Um, some places commonly mistaken for centers include shopping malls, strip malls, office parks, and light industry clusters. And while these places do have some of the qualities of centers, they don't have um, all of them. And typically they tend to be very auto-oriented and single use, which means they're not as accessible and not as attractive. So this is my last slide. Um, Ari touched a little bit on your Utah, your future, um, which was a vision for 11 different topics, including water, public lands, energy, transportation and communities, housing, education. And one of the four cornerstones for achieving that vision was a network of quality communities. So a network of centers throughout the region to help increase accessibility um, throughout Utah. And then the second major plan I wanted to discuss was Wasatch Choice 2050, which was a regional vision composed by 11 partners, including uh, Wasatch Front Regional Council, Mountain Land Association of Governments, ULCT, and many others. Um, so what I wanted to say is just that this is on the minds of many of the big players across the state as we look to the future of Utah. And with that, I'll give it back to Ari. All right, thanks, Michaela. Um, little overview of what a center is. Um, now we're putting up another question here. We want to know who we've got. Uh, so go ahead and click for which part of the state you're from. Um, we've got a pretty good representation of a lot of the state here. All right, we'll give you about five more seconds. So we've got about 60% of you from the Wasatch Front, it looks like. Um, let me go ahead and close it. Um, but a very, fairly good uh, representation from the rest of the state, um, probably a little bit in, in excess of the population distribution. So that's pretty good. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks, Michaela. Next, we're going to go to uh, Megan Townsend, who is uh, the program manager for the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program at Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about different types and scales of centers. Um, so Megan, go ahead. All right, just sharing my screen. Hi everyone, and in Vision Utah, thank you for having me. As Ari said, I'm Megan Townsend with the Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, a touch on a, a little bit of what both Michaela and Ted have, um, have touched on a bit. Um, just one second. There we go. Okay. And that is just the, the typologies of centers um, according to the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision. Um, get things out of my way here. Okay. Um, the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision is our community's shared vision for transportation investments and interrelated land and economic development. Um, Michaela gave a background on, on the partnership with the Wasatch Choice Vision. Um, this map strategically locates centers and transportation infrastructure across the region. Um, the goals of the vision are regional, but the land use piece is steered by local governments and implemented through local planning. So it's, it's working together to accomplish regional goals on a local level. Um, I'll note that this, this vision applies to the Wasatch Front area um, from Box Elder County down through Utah County, but the, type, the center's typologies are more broadly applicable throughout the state. Um, and I'm gonna get into more of what these yellow and orange shapes mean, um, but first let's talk about what all of them have in common. So there are three key ingredients that um, regardless of the scale of a center, all of these things, all, all of these centers have in common, and that is that they are walkable. Um, maybe they have smaller block sizes, or maybe there are treatments to the streets like trees and things that make it nice to be there, nice to walk there. Um, they are concentrated, so they're more concentrated than the surrounding area, and it's all relative. Um, this doesn't mean that centers are dense. It doesn't even mean that they are, have any kind of a vertical element. Um, they can be one story. It's just that they're, they're the center of activity for wherever they are. Um, and as Ted noted, you know, this can take a density pressure off of the surrounding area. So where you may have um, lots of single family neighborhoods surrounding or even a lot of open space, um, if you're able to concentrate some of those um, services and retail uses, 
in your in your center or your downtown this can take some of, some of the pressure off of the rest of your your city um, and last of the three ingredients these centers all have a mix of uses um, it, it's different for every center again it's all relative what those uses may be um, but while you might have just retail in some parts of an area or just residential elsewhere um, maybe all of those things and more are present in your center like office or um, flex space, maybe venues or um, civic space as well. Okay, now the Wasatch Choice Regional Vision has four different scales of centers um, that are kind of contextually appropriate for, for Utah and for the Wasatch Front. And those are a metropolitan center of which we, the vision currently claims one, Salt Lake City, downtown central business district, um, an urban center, a city center, and then the smallest of those is a neighborhood center. So I'll talk about the differences of those. Um, so again, metropolitan center, think Salt Lake City, Central Business District. Um, you know, who knows, maybe a few more of these will pop up. Um, there's, there's some uh, competition both north and south of, of Salt Lake City. Um, but as of now, you know, this is where our, our, our center of activity is in this metro area. And the catchment, or and I'll talk about the catchment of these different center scales. The catchment of a metropolitan center is, uh, you know, the entire metro area, and that's how many people the center draws periodically. Um, for some, it may be very infrequent that they visit um, the metropolitan center. Um, some of some people may live, work, and dine there, and and hardly ever leave um, because there's plenty to do. Um, so, but the entire metro area is the is the potential catchment for a metropolitan center. Um, the, the amount of stories or kind of the building massing in a metropolitan center is probably at least four in, in the true central business district and, and up to 25 or beyond. Um, this, is where, this is where a skyscraper might be. Um, and then the land use, you know, we use these in the Wasatch Trace Vision typologies, we use land use indicators to kind of help us gauge what a center um, what a center scale might be. And so the land use indicator for a metropolitan center is unique destinations. Um, in Salt Lake City, we have Temple Square, we have the Broadway Theater, there are many cultural centers, all of these things you, you may find scattered throughout the state, but um, you find them clustered in, this, in the Salt Lake City Central Business District or a metropolitan center. Stepping down the scale a little bit is the urban center. This is a rendering from, of South Salt Lake. I like this rendering because I think it shows the scale of an urban center really well. Um, this is along the S line. Some of this is in progress, some not so much yet, but um, this center shows that it's very walkable. You see lots of little people. Um, the catchment area of a urban center might be about 100,000 people. That's the population of Orem for reference. Um, and the, the building massing or the amount of stories might be anywhere from four to 10 stories. Um, again, that's, this is all relative, relative to the place. There are a lot of um, more tourism economies in our state and they have what you might call an urban center that's smaller. Um, and the land use indicator for an urban center is that it has some significant commerce and regional retail. So. Um, maybe several services, uh, you know, more shopping than just grocery, those kinds of things. Next up is our city center. This is an image in West Jordan of uh, an up and coming city center, I would call it at Jordan Valley Station. Um, this, the city center is a really good fit for transit oriented development and I'll get into why. Um, you can walk safely here, you can use transit to get there. You can also park pretty easily. You know, you see some surface lots for those folks that live in those apartments. The catchment area of a city center might be 25,000 people. Again, could be more, could be less. This is just a, just a, a way to kind of put your thumb on it. And 25,000 people is the population of Farmington. Um, the building massing or, or stories might be two to five for a city center. And the land use indicator could be grocery, restaurant, civic, retail. Um, everyday uses is what I like to think of city centers as having um, and things that you 
you might really like to access via transit, um, pick up groceries on the way home, um, stop at a restaurant at your, on your lunch break, um, drop in your ballot at the, uh, at the city hall, those kinds of, of uses. And finally, the neighborhood center, and we think local here. This example is in Salt Lake City. It's one of my favorite neighborhood centers at 15th and 15th. Um, this is not dense or it's not vertically dense. It's a single story uses. You have a gallery here. You have a bookstore, the King's English. Um, you, have, you have restaurants, some, some tucked way in the back. Um, and there's even, there's even a couple of chain restaurants in here, but they feel really local. Um, the catchment area for a neighborhood center could be just 2,500 people. Really, it's just the neighborhood. Uh, there are some really attractive neighborhood centers in our state that I think attract much more than just the neighborhood because you want to walk there, you want to be there, um, especially right now when you're just trying to find a nice place to take a walk. Um, it, it could be one to three stories, maybe bigger, depending where you are, um, but it, it doesn't have to be dense. Um, and the land use indicator here is just some retail, maybe even just civic uses, and, and I like to say think local. Last thing I'll leave you with here is that, you know, it doesn't matter what the scale of the center is, make it work for your community. Um, I have a photo on the left of Kanab. I really like that photo. And um, on the right of Moab, whatever the center is, just make it, make it work for your community. A center is and always should be evolving. That's how they survive and um, local planning and policies can both support that evolution as well as um, help help you to maintain the, the character of a city, city center. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Ari. Stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Megan. And um, just one quick note, um, we are recording these presentations and the recording will be available afterwards and we'll make the presentations available as well. Um, some of you are already voting. We've got a, a question up on the screen about your own community. Uh, what kind of scale of center exists there or is there not a clear center in your community today? Um, so this is a little bit of a quiz to see if we paid attention to Megan about the different scales. Uh, <laughs> kind of to recap though, she, she mentioned uh, kind of the three characteristics of centers. They're walkable, they're more concentrated than the surrounding area and they have a mix of uses. Um, and then they also have a variety of scales. So some may have great transit access, others may not, but they all have good access. Uh, so it looks like most of you have voted and we'll end the polling there. So um, a lot of you already have centers in your communities, it looks like. Um, not always, uh, maybe not necessarily a large center like the Metro or Urban Center, but maybe a smaller scale one like a city or neighborhood center. Um, that's good to hear. Um, with that, um, next we're gonna hear from Paul Allred, who's the Community Development Director at the City of Holiday. And they have gone through a process of implementing their own center, the Holiday Village Center. And he's going to tell us a little bit about that. So, Paul. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Got my video up. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, I don't know why it's going to the bottom, starting at the bottom, but uh, just gonna have to start at the top here. Uh, okay, uh, I'm with Holiday City. I've been here about 15 years, and uh, we have a small, uh, what we call our city center, it's Holiday Village. Uh, some of you have probably heard of it. We've actually been visited by quite a few cities um, over the past uh, few years as this has built up. And uh, I'm going to talk about benefits of centers today. There are quite a few. I've listed about, oh, nine or ten that I'll touch on briefly uh, because there are obviously more uh, benefits to, sit to uh, centers than just the ones I have listed. Um, I'll start with a sense of place uh, or a sense of belonging. And I think this is something that all of us uh, really crave is having a place to be, having a place where we belong. 
And wherever we move, wherever we live, we, we tend to go look for a place that makes us feel at home, especially if we move somewhere. Uh, Holiday chose its uh, downtown area. Uh, so these are some of the benefits here uh, that you can read down through quickly. But I'm going to kind of focus on our city just to kind of talk about these benefits and go back and forth a little bit. Um, this is our historic downtown area, kind of an aerial photo. And you'll see that there are several roads that come together here. And hey, in this hey, location- Paul, if, you, if yeah. you try clicking on the going to presenter mode again, now that you've got that slide selected, I think it'll work for you. There we go. Thank you, it wouldn't work there before. We go. Thanks, Ari. All right, so if you can see this, you can see that there are several roads that, that kind of converge in our downtown area. This is where Holiday had its traditional downtown. And uh, when the city incorporated in 2000, we're actually at the end of 99, we're only 20 years old, the city immediately knew from the very beginning that they wanted to rec recapture kind of the magic of their old downtown area, where the old gas station had been, where the theater had been, uh, where the old stores had been. Some of you may remember Partners and Video Verns and the old paint store. Well, those areas got run down and they got abandoned. And so what the city of Holiday did was they, uh, they purchased this, uh, the old elementary school right here, which is our, now our city hall. And uh, our city hall is now uh, part of the village center, was part of the village center. And with this purchase, we decided to put a stake in the ground and kind of develop our village uh, around an activity center here. So creating activity centers within a center is important. But that sense of belonging, that old school could have been torn down, but many holiday residents went to this school when they were children. So instead of getting rid of the building, we decided to remodel it and hang on to it. And we've kept some of the old fashioned things in it. So when people come in, they feel comfortable. They, they, they like it there. And then we went from there and did quite a few other things. Um, this is kind of before and after. I know it's not really fair, one's in color, one's, one's not. But we used to have these two roads that came together right here that created a very awkward intersection. This is the old partners and video burns. And, and this is, was the heart of the old holiday area. But uh, you can see that um, it was a very confusing intersection here. So the city uh, got some funding together, uh, redid the roads and you'll see what they did was they closed, uh, oh, they closed one road here and turned this into a plaza. So this looks like a road, but that's actually a plaza a half acre plaza and then here's our new development which I'll show you in a minute but they turned the road here and created uh, a nice intersection and then from here it just comes down and we got rid of this awkward intersection where two roads came together I don't know that there's too many people who who pine for that so this kind of shows a before and after of how unorganized it was but you will see that there was some there was some urban design here these buildings were up close to the street so we replicated that with these new buildings here. Um, this kind of shows you uh, before and after of that main intersection. So where those two roads came together, this is our plaza right here. And you can see this is the old uh, intersection where this clock tower is, is where these buildings were. So you can see that there's a dramatic transformation. And even though none of you can raise your hands, I'll bet if I were to ask you what's the one thing that jumps out visually in this picture more than anything else, you'd say it's the overhead power lines. Um, the city spent some money and we took those power lines down through the middle of the village so that these buildings would have an unobstructed view corridor and uh, that it would uh, free up our sidewalk. So this was a, a dramatic aesthetic change that we made. We spent some money, it took some money to do that, but it was worth it because you can see what has resulted as a change. So you're gonna see a lot of before and afters and this, this uh, slideshow from Holiday is not a bring and brag. We're not bragging on ourselves. We're just, we like to share our experiences with anybody who wants to know. And uh, we're hoping to do a little bit of that today without this uh, feeling like we're uh, bragging on ourselves. There's that old corner and you can see that these businesses were right up on the sidewalk, but this is an old broken down asphalt sidewalk. We had some broken windows. This is 2005. So I started with the city in 2005 and these got torn down right after. So the city bought this property here, 1.8 acres. We relocated a pharmacy to a different uh, place in the village area. We relocated a couple of businesses to make the village work, but we, 
we really needed to get rid of all of this overhead stuff that really destroys that wonderful view of Mount Olympus. So this is a before and there's our after. This is a two-story building. Uh, the clock tower is very uh, central. Um, we spent an enormous amount of time looking for the right kind of architecture that we wanted. This part of the building here is an amalgam of four different buildings, uh, all from the state of Utah and some from central Utah and southern Utah. So we worked with an architect and the property owner here and came up with a beautiful new design to get some ground floor retail. And this is all office. One thing that we did miss out on was we didn't get any residential with the initial uh, village development. Here's another before. This is looking southbound from that, toward that same intersection where the clock tower is here and uh, all the power lines were. And you can see this is just kind of a rundown strip center, nothing to write home about. And um, so this is what we looked at every day in 2005, which really doesn't seem that long ago. And this is what it looks like now. Uh, quite pleasant uh, looking down uh, through the plaza. And this road, this road used to continue on through here, but now it's all part of a plaza where we have a raised platform and, and we have people performing. And here's the old Burton Lumber. One thing you might notice in the pictures is the dramatic lack of landscaping uh, from uh, the previous pictures. There's really no trees. You don't, it's all the focus is on signs here. And, uh, and asphalt, it dominates your view. But if you look here, architecture of the buildings and the skyline and the trees really make a difference. So we spent quite a bit of time designing what kind of trees would go down here and some hanging baskets. So uh, it's real pleasant. Here's a before, looking at that main intersection again. And then here's an after. And this is the new Harmons. Uh, we got a, we have a Harmon store that's uh, only about 18,000 square feet compared to their massive stores, but it's uh, on three different levels. And if you look carefully, these are outdoor sitting areas, a kind of a mezzanine sitting area for people to sit out when the weather is nice. And then inside, there's a big sitting area. Also down here, there's some public art and a nice place for people to sit. So one of the things we did with the village was we wanted, wanted to build our buildings right up close to the sidewalk and provide places for people to walk. Uh, this is our bike lane through here, and that's another benefit is you get health and recreation. On the weekends, this is a highly traveled area for bikes and pedestrians year round. So building the bike lanes was critical and uh, getting the buildings close to the street to create that presence uh, worked really well. So there's a, um, here's another one where those two roads came together and look how awkward this is with this uh, car right here. Uh, this building's still here, by the way. It's being turned into a spa. Uh, the pharmacy has been relocated. It turned into a Walgreens, but uh, you know, we had some pharmacy wars down here. So here's before and here's after. You can really see the stark difference, the color, the architecture, the richness of the buildings, uh, the patterns here. These are things that our city council, planning commission and staff worked very, very long on to get it to feel just right, to feel very welcoming. And even with all of our work, there are some things we failed at. These hanging baskets, though, are not one of our failures in our period kind of uh, uh, light fixtures. And uh, we have light fixtures on the building that work really well, too. Um, there's a before, and that's the same exact shot uh, later. Some of these buildings have just been redone. So you can see that it's Myers Chicken here and these, this building here. You can see that they're still there, but they've been redone. Some of them, when they come in remodeled, in our ordinances, we require that if you do a certain amount of remodeling, you've got to change the exterior of your building to fit in with what the rest is going on in our ordinances in the village. Um, a real benefit is economic development. This is the Harmons building that I pointed out a minute ago. Once we had an anchor in our village, it, it, it brought a lot of other businesses that wanted to be downtown restaurants and our inquiries about how do we get into holiday? How can we come into your downtown? Uh, really took off. Uh, it wasn't easy getting a building uh, this attractive built, uh, but our hats are off to Harmons working with us. Uh, there was a struggle along the way because we do have architectural standards in the village, which is a prime requirement. I would make sure that anybody who's gonna do a village out there, make sure you adopt an architectural standard and you stick to it. So this is a real benefit is having an anchor like this and Harmons has been uh, wildly successful and, and very popular. Um, 
this development right across from the lumber yard, which is one of our oldest businesses that also came because of the new plaza being built. The plaza is literally right here to the left of this car. And these new sidewalks, what you get is you get new public infrastructure. When you do a village, you're gonna upgrade your infrastructure, your light poles, your hanging baskets, your crosswalks, your sidewalks, your landscaping. Um, and one of the real critical things that, that we got with public infrastructure is all this angled parking. Angled parking harkens back to a more pleasant time. Uh, maybe when some of us were kids, some of us older folks were kids, you went downtown and there was always angled parking on the street. City built and worked with developers to put in a lot of on-street parking, which is really nice. Uh, and it adds to the ambiance downtown. So you get a lot of public investment and improvement with the downtown center. Um, here's one of the most obvious benefits. Look carefully at this picture. Um, you can see, uh, hold on, uh, you can't see clear down to the bottom there, but off to the right, you'll see that the village uh, square buildings, the tower is being built. And before the, the building was even finished, we had a blue moon festival here in Holiday. And we had about 6,000 people show up. So this was taken from a boom on a uh, fire truck. And this showed the pent up need that people had to want to be together. And so it was just, it was so heartwarming to go to this event, and wander around and see people that we work with, you know, some of our neighbors and friends in the neighborhoods who came out long before other uh, buildings were built. There's a pent up need for people who want to be together. They want to socialize. Another benefit is we did a food truck park on the south end of our village. Some of you may have been there, but this food truck park is a fun place. On the weekend, they may get up to 1,500 people there on a Friday and a Saturday. Uh, they're continuously making improvements to the uh, food truck park, but it's been very popular with uh, most of our residents. Some of those in the nearby neighborhood haven't been too happy about it, but um, overall, the neighborhood that's nearest to this is the one that uh, frequents it the most. So you get a lot of social multiplier effect and uh, business economic uh, multiplier effect some of you might ask, well, did the other restaurants in the neighborhood complain about this? Actually, we went and talked to some of them. And we found that most of them said that their business went up once the food truck park went in. So um, competition's a good thing. Um, I just wanna talk about this a little bit. This is our fire station that we did. It's a couple of blocks west of our village. It's not in our village, but we built it in 2013. And we chose an, a kind of a, a period architecture. This is an amalgam of three buildings two in Utah, one in Pennsylvania, uh, to come up with our fire station and work with our local architect. But this kind of sets the tone for the village and even a theme from out, for outside the village of a, a quality development. So the city walked the walk in terms of, of not saying you had to do one thing in the village and they weren't willing to do it on their own. And this is a building that eventually got approved. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that this was a building that got approved in our village to replace the old one. And while I do miss eating at Apollo Burger, a couple of blocks from where I sit right now, um, you can see that this building um, really doesn't have that charm of some of the other buildings. So uh, these guys ended up walking away and it got approved over the objections of staff because we didn't think it met with our village regulations. But in terms of urban design, you want to be consistent in your downtown area. So this is what's being approved in its place. And I know the scale is quite a bit bigger, but you can see that there's a difference in how the building uh, faces the street. This is a, a, uh, a mixed use building with two stories of residential on top of, uh, res uh, tops of restaurant and commercial. This is all underground parked or parked behind the building. And uh, we have on-street parking as well. So again, you look at before and after and you look at, well, this is what we could have had, but this is what we got. And we feel like this is one of the real wins that we had. And uh, I'll just kind of finish by showing this one is being built. This will be finished in the next two or three months. This is all underground parked as well. A nice condo building. This is all residential. Uh, and in our village, one of, the, one of the problems that we had was we didn't have residential downtown. And, uh, but fortunately, in the last two or three years and with what's being built now, we will add about 130 units of housing in our downtown. Unfortunately, none of it is going to be affordable. Uh, we weren't able to make that happen, but uh, it's, it's incredibly popular for people who want to uh, live here. So uh, we're getting that nice uh, mix of, of housing, commercial, uh, office, and retail. 
And uh, this is part of the city hall. And I just wanted to make a final statement that public investment's essential. Uh, the city, we did rebuild the city hall. This is a gazebo where we have our 4th of July. We hold a lot of events out here. This gazebo is just a few hundred feet from uh, the city plaza and the clock tower building. So to uh, just go back uh, up to the top and look at some of those benefits, um, you can see that these private public partnerships and improved infrastructure and community branding, these are all important. And I would just have one word of caution and that is don't overpark your center if you're gonna build one. Biggest mistake you can make is uh, over parking. And I know a lot of people don't wanna hear that, but I can promise you uh, that I know what I'm talking about on this one. Uh, we, we hit it out of the park by not having too much parking. If you have too much parking, you'll have a strip center and not a uh, downtown center. So I'll turn it back to Ari and there you go. Thanks, Thanks. Paul. That was great, uh, beautiful village center. Um, I think everyone probably noticed the great attention to detail there um, in terms of everything from the plants that are placed and the buildings right up to the sidewalk and the note about parking was also a great note as well. So um, we are now gonna ask you um, about the barriers to building a center in your community. A lot of you said you already have centers, so you can think of this building one or improving the center in your community. Um, so is the issue you're seeing a lack of market demand for some of the uses you'd like to see? Is it uh, uh, NIMBYism or just uh, nearby residents who are opposed to intensifying and so on? Is it inadequate infrastructure? Is it a lack of vision or political will, which could overlap with the NIMBYism? Um, is it lack of land availability or maybe that the title's fragmented? Um, so think about your community and what you want to accomplish and what's the number one barrier? It may be multiple barriers, but. Uh... Looking like the lack of vision or political will is uh, taking the day right now. Followed by NIMBYism and those could be very interrelated. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting response. So. Uh, with that, um, we're now going to turn to uh, two presenters we have from the private sector. Um, so the first is going to be uh, Stephen James. He's the Director of Planning and Community Design at Daybreak Communities, and they've done a lot of uh, center development and placemaking there in Daybreak in South Jordan. So, Stephen? All right. Uh, thanks, Ari. Uh, it's been great to hear the presentations uh, thus far. I think you'll see a lot of uh, echoing in what I have to say. Uh, I think centers are great ways to uh, attract people. You know, I've been addressed, uh, asked to address uh, design elements of centers, but you know, design can be really fussy. There are a lot of attitudes about what uh, design is good and appropriate. Uh, I think it needs to be contextual. So I'm going to step back a bit and talk about centering and linking as design elements uh, in, uh, in centers. Uh, the, you know, the center is less a real estate classification and more an attitude about how to craft places that many people thrive in. You know, great centers are really just great neighborhoods with more to it than just uh, than housing. With, uh, and so how do you know when you're in a center? Well, you see your neighbors, plus everyone that likes to hang out, play, shop, or eat, or work there. So centers have gravity to them. They attract people. You know, there are known models in real estate world for creating centers, but I'm not sure they're any good because the primary focus is commerce. And that's certainly important, important but if as a region we want to reduce the environmental and societal impacts of the commute, then we've got to introduce living into centers. And so uh, if centers are to be the heart of the neighborhood, village, or town, they need to be either contextual or aspirational. So centers really have to have a heart uh, to be a heart. So these are the three primary universal design characteristics, the design elements that I think are important. I, if we get into actual architectural issues, I think that'll really confuse issues because it's actually hard to really dictate good design. Design is a process of, 
of discovering what something wants to, to be. And, and uh, in my work, I always run up against challenges on standards and intent and what's actually possible. Um, and so I, I tend to think of design standards a little removed from the actual architecture. I mean, the longer I work on making centers, the more I realize that initial vision is always transformed. The important design elements don't always show up or do what you hoped they would. It's great in the example of Holiday, uh, where they created this fantastic place. But I think making successful centers requires flexibility and adapting in real time to real estate transactions and deal making. So we rely more on sound principles than preconceived solutions or design standards in our work in Daybreak. Now, it didn't always used to be that way. We started with very clear design standards, but now we're a little more facile in the way we work with partners to get outcomes that don't preclude the good. And it allows us to un uncover unexpected ideas and urban solutions, things that we didn't know about or could have anticipated as we were planning or, or uh, conceiving our centers. Um, so just thinking about centers here at Daybreak, uh, you know, everyone, most of our partners want to build a typical shopping center, <laughs> but a shopping center is not a center at all. You know, it's really a, a ribbon or a cluster of stores that amenitize parking lots. And um, people really don't want to eat at a table in a parking lot. They would rather just stay in their car idling while waiting for their food, right? So some people say that people want to eat in their cars because it's fast and they're in a rush. But I contend that we're generally not building the types of environments where we want to go and get out and slow down. So how do you design centers that are simply uh, not attractions along a highway? You know, and I, I think some of the previous presenters touched on this, but it really uh, starts with these three uh, design elements on the screen, a mix of land uses. Hey, as hey uh, Stephen, your slides aren't showing, so. They aren't? No. Oh, I apologize for that. Good thing I have only shown one. <laughs> we can we imagine. Share, share screen. You see that? I'm seeing your notes right now. You're seeing my notes. All right. There's my appointment. I had this all set up. Let's see. All righty. Maybe it's share screen, a different one. Screen one. There we go. How's that? That's better. That's the wrong slide. All right, I thought I had this all set up, so I apologize. I just moved forward as if, I, if, this, if it was working. Uh, so getting back to the uh, design characteristics of centers, uh, you know, the mix of land uses organized uh, to center neighborhoods has been discussed, strong convenient links to other neighborhoods. Uh, that gets back to Ted's idea of where matters and the bikeable, walkable, and drivable urbanism. This is a, an interesting idea uh, that you got to get the relationship between the street and the door right. So if there are just three things that need to happen, I think those are the three and the architecture can vary wildly and still be a wild success. Um, let's see. You know, people don't want to live in a shopping center, right? They want to live in great neighborhoods. So what makes a neighborhood uh, great? Well, it's, uh, you know, all those things we hear about, safe place to live for sure, you know, with good schools and safe streets. Uh, centers ought to be these types of places as well. Though the building typology changes and the land uses uh, diversify so that people recognize they are centered. And there are, you know, many ways to do this. Um, when I was a young designer starting work on Daybreak 20 years ago, Peter Calthorpe would tell me, that the architecture didn't matter. He said, you gotta get the urbanism right. And this is what he meant by the relationship between the street and the door. You know, there, and there's more than one right relationship. I mean, you'll find that different people have different opinions about the type of place they wanna be in. And so you have to calibrate your decisions and, and respond to the aspirations of the population. And how you transition from one uh, relationship to the next really depends 
or really helps people get centered. So in my work, I strive to develop a constellation of centers. For example, here's a planning diagram of a small portion of uh, Daybreak, and on the bottom right is Soda Row, the village center. And it's populated with housing that gradually step, steps up in scale to relate to the size of the commercial buildings. So this is a visual cue that one is being centered, and the center is a natural extension of the neighborhood. Uh, the design invites a casual walk across the street to get a sandwich or a drink. And this is what Ari was talking about when he says his boy can go to the bakery and he doesn't have to worry about him feeling safe. The transitions between uh, places feel natural because the sidewalk's the line and the commercial street's character is compatible with the adjacent uh, residential streets. And when you place the parking behind, these relationships are uh, possible. Um, and uh, when the space is good, it doesn't matter uh, that you cannot park right in front of the door. I mean, who doesn't mind getting out and stretching their legs a little bit? But centers need to be attractive to people. So try to think of it this way. And some of you may have seen this slide before, but uh, plan for a car, but designed for pedestrians, right? So I picked up this pain scale at a maternity ward many years ago um, and uh, started applying it to street design. We should all be considering how our policies, uh, our design standards, and our decisions yield painful or painless experiences in centers. Here's a case in point. Both of these place types are centers, uh, or try to be. On the top, we have a shopping center. Below, we have, have a village center. The shopping center is no center at all, really, uh, because it's designed for one mode of transportation, and there are no, no short local trips to this place. There's no housing. No way to get around without driving. It really doesn't have a heart. Typical shopping is just a type of roadside attraction, uh, really, and, and these types of places, I think, are salvageable, and uh, we see that happening throughout many of our communities now. Village centers are what you are where you go for a quick errand, um, uh, and where you go to meet up with friends and you know get a bite to eat. These places are scaled primarily uh, to meet the needs of the local residents, so the car can be can stay at home. And again, there are many ways to design these uh, centers. People like to hang out at this one, uh, even when the stores are closed. It seems to be an Instagram spot, uh, but uh, great centers also uh, make room for uh, strollers. That's what we've discovered. We, we have generally a shortage of stroller parking areas. But get creative with the land uses used in your centers. We recently transformed a dead corner at Soda Row uh, into a boathouse that just opened this uh, last weekend that I'm really excited about. I actually went and took my lunch uh, down there this afternoon. Uh, so now there's uh, rowing at Soda Row. So if you wonder where that row came from, this was a big idea. It just took us forever to get to it. So take advantage of the context available to you, uh, or if you're working on a green or a brownfield site, make a context. You know, that's what I really liked about Paul's presentation. He talked about how those two roads converged and, and how solving a problem actually created a great place. And that's what placemaking is really about. It's, it's a kind of urban fujitsu. You know, you take a, a problem and make it special. You know, we didn't have a lake, so we made one. Um, and we did it so we could put another village center on it uh, because we we discovered that people really like to come to the one that we had so this one's starting construction uh, shortly and it'll have a small format Harmon's not unlike the holiday uh, neighborhood market We're really excited about it it'll have a few places to eat and more homes integrated uh, into the community for more people we think that the link between housing and amenity is so critical and so, uh, you know, the mix of use uh, is what makes it a neighborhood. And it has to have the housing to be a, a neighborhood. And this will feel like a simple extension of the neighborhood. It won't feel like a project. And I think that's really important to a seamless transition from one place to the next. And, you know, we're, we continue to find ways to enhance these types of experiences. But your context doesn't need to be lake. Uh, and that's, you know, for you and your, your citizenry and your uh, staff to figure out uh, what is it that you want to build on. Um, you know, back to the previous diagram, in addition to the village center, we have clusters of, I mean, these don't quite fit the definition of neighborhood center, but it has the same function in that they are places of gravity, you know, and 
they're places where people can meet up and they're just a few short blocks away from home. So these are still centering devices and they can be quite simple. In our case, they're built around churches and schools or community centers, clubhouses, even park amenities if they're designed in a centered fashion. You know, we've got a beach and a dog park and a playground, two clubhouses, you know, in these four centers. It's not enough to have just one center, uh, but a distribution of centers, I call it a constellation of centers, is what really gets people into the community. You know, we think of the entire community of Daybreak as a transit-oriented development because as soon as you get people to walk out their front door and leave their car at home, they're using a transit mode other than vehicular uh, traffic. And, and, it's, and we developed this, what we call a string of pearls idea, where we're just lacing experiences through the whole plan. And people really seem to thrive on this type of exp uh, experience. Also to reiterate what Paul said, we generally don't provide, we try our best not to over park. And in some of these smaller neighborhood scale centers, we provide no parking at all. And uh, my primary focus in the last few years was thinking about how to build, you know, here we, we call it a town center, but it's really an urban center, uh, you know, from scratch. Uh, this is our current draft of what we're calling downtown daybreak. The colored elements in, within the purple bubble are land uses that are either complete or at various stages of planning, design, and permitting. And wh what we're seeing is a very incremental uh, approach to to urban center building and the nice thing about this is it won't have an overly scripted feel but the principles of how buildings orient to streets where the doors go what the doors relationship is to uh, uh, to the right-of-way uh, is very uh, very evident in the plan you know we started this planning in earnest back in 2008 around the principles of walkable urbanism and we did a number of renderings and early sketches to remind us what we were working toward but you know as as we evolve you know the dis, uh, the districts and work to differentiate uh, the character of the town center uh, you know but we we all know that as we try to implement a long-term vision things uh you know don't always occur as you hope or envision them uh, but that's okay if what we are really envisioning are principles instead of explicit design approaches. So this is an example of a project now that's just been built. Unfortunately, I don't have any photography to it. But this is essentially liner townhomes that feed the streets right into Granville, our main street, our transit boulevard. And these uh, townhome products contain parking. Uh, and transition into this, which is also under construction. We have a county library on the left and uh, an apartment, vertical mixed use apartment project on the right. So these uh, are in various stages of complete uh, completion. Um, and we're really excited to see how it's changing the scale and how this type of development is enabling uh, further development. It's, it's context creation. Uh, in a place that most people view as a greenfield site, and why wouldn't you just build in a suburban format? And so we've taken a very incremental approach, gradually building up in scale, so that uh, our plan and our vision uh, make sense in the marketplace. Uh, development partners, when they come to Daybreak now to look at sites, they, they get it, they get where we're headed and they know they're not the first in. So what we do in our planning and design work is do our best to alleviate the risk um, uh, that our development partners feel if, if they uh, sense that they're the first guy in. That's always a bit of a, uh, a problem in the planning. So uh, just to, to wrap up, as you think about centering, it requires strong pedestrian and bicycle linkages, the very best you can muster really. I mean, the smaller the blocks, uh, the better, especially for PEDS. So you can see here, as we're moving into our town center on the left, we're actually scaling the pedestrian uh, connectivity down. So the blocks are, are quarter size of a downtown Salt Lake City block, roughly 300 feet square. Not all of them are streets. Some of them are Mews, Greens, and Paseos that lace these uses together. The principles that we use, though, are that we're always containing parking. Because parking does not contribute to a pedestrian environment. People don't like to sit at a table in a parking lot, but they really enjoy a beautiful street. 
Uh, transit stops are really nice too, be they bus or, or train to provide options for people who live a bit more remotely and aren't able to, uh, to walk in town or bike into town. Um, uh, and then the, uh, the auto needs to be accommodated. You know, that's, that's a no brainer. We're not saying displace the vehicle, but we're saying uh, create balance within the plan. So at daybreak, we orient larger automobile infrastructure to regional transit systems like highways. And we really emphasize pedestrian and bikeways through the plan itself. Just recognizing what area, where is the traffic coming from? How do we accommodate it? And make sure we don't preclude smart development uh, and pedestrian scale uh, elsewhere. You know, so parking is important, but not at the expense of the guy who wants to arrive, you know, on a different set of four wheels, you know, that, that doesn't need to be parked or those that prefer just two or at the expense of those that don't have any wheels yet. You know, these are the people we're really designing for. And if we make a strong effort to uh, introduce youngsters to smart growth principles, it will be what they expect. And that's what we're seeing here in our community is how much the young people thrive in environments like this. I think that's one of the most motivating aspects of working through the difficult challenges of this type of development is, is how people like it. So just to sum it up again, think about building a constellation of centers. It's not a one and done thing, but how do you link them and create nodes and anchors uh, in your town? So what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to create the cities within a city idea at daybreak as we blend in village centers and uh, with our urban center. And don't be afraid to mix it up. Throw it all in the salad. You know, use design cohesion uh, and good problem solving skills to mitigate the impacts of the various uses that present themselves. I think there's always a good design uh, solution. Um, so we're not afraid to consider the non-conventional use uh, in a center. Um, and, uh, you know, again, mix up the uses. It's easier for us all if we don't have to travel so much uh, to meet the de demands of our, of our lives. People choose to vacation in places like what you see on the right, where there are small, beautiful districts, each complete with all the elements of the city. Uh, but often we're stuck living in the places on the left because that's all there's available uh, for the most part, which are these sort of segregated zones that require significant investment in transportation. So again, quick summary, uh, think about your plans in terms of mix of land uses organized to center neighborhoods. These centers are neighborhoods, they're not just centers, you know, housing and living in these places is what's critical. I think that's what's gonna help solve some of the challenges that we have, the growth challenges. Strong and convenient links to other neighborhoods are critical. Get people on their feet or on two wheels this idea of walkable, bikeable, and drivable urbanism is important. Make sure you get the relationship between the sidewalk and the front door right. You know, we've seen a lot of buildings recently that are placed on the street, but the door is in the parking lot. And so when you walk down the street, you see electrical panels and you see, uh, you know, windows with posters in them, but you can't actually get in. You got to walk around to the parking lot to get in. That is sort of halfway uh, there, but not quite. We really need to find ways to get the doors on the street and put the parking in the back. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. That was uh, that was great. I love the phrase "plan for the car and design for pedestrians." Uh, but uh, lots of great points there. Um, uh, we are going to ask you another question here. Um, since uh, this isn't the last uh, kind of webinar training or material we're ever going to put out. So we're curious, um, in terms of centers, what are things you want to hear more about? So um, is it the benefits of centers? Is it how to implement them? Is it how to pay for them, the financing part? Is it how to do community outreach? And it, or is it myth busting? Um, the, the things you tend to hear from some parts of the public about crime and traffic and so on. So we've got a lot of you voting here. All right, we're gonna give you about eight more seconds. And we'll probably uh, focus a lot of our uh, 
Q and A part at the end on some of these things you're voting for. And, and by the way, uh, feel free to enter some questions into that Q and A uh, piece there and we'll get to as many as we can. So it looks like implementation and myth busting are the top two here that you wanna hear about. So great. Um, our last speaker today is gonna be uh, Randy Woodbury. He's the president of the Woodbury Corporation. And uh, they have been in business a hundred years now, I think, Randy. Uh, uh, doing developments in Utah, um, you might think of uh, University Mall, which is now University Place, as a great example of something they've built that's becoming a mixed-use center. So, Randy. Thanks, Ari. Well, I was asked to talk about, as a developer, what it actually takes to create a center. And so I'm going to just touch on four things. Just a moment about what makes developers tick, what drives them. Uh, mostly to talk about the process that a development company like ours goes through in getting a project off the ground. Maybe a thought or two on, on um, what cities might do to better work with developers. And, and lastly, if a developers aren't knocking on your door to create centers in your city, what you might do to attract them. So, developers. 40 plus years ago, my grandfather left a handwritten note on my desk one morning that read, an optimist will build castles in the sky, a dreamer will live there, and a realist will collect rent from both of them. Uh, you know, developers by nature are optimists. They're visionaries and they are risk takers, but they also need to be realists. What we do is we look for opportunities. We seek to fill an unmet need in the marketplace. The last thing we want to do is develop something for which there is no demand. Centers can vary greatly and they can be designed to address various needs for the community and the neighborhood. So what is the need? Is it housing? Is it retail services? Is it office, hospitality, restaurants, entertainment, medical services? Depending on the scope and size of the project, any of those uses can be integrated into a well-designed center. Now certainly we want our centers to be financially successful but we also take a lot of satisfaction in being part of the communities in which we develop and helping them grow and improve. So the process, the development process from our view, <clears throat> if we have an idea, an unmet need, something we want to develop, first thing we need to do is we need to find available land for the development or redevelopment. And you know, the old real estate adage of location, location, location is still relevant. As Ted says, maybe the new way to state that is where matters. And I love that phrase. So we have to start with a visualization of a concept. And we, you know, we employ professional uh, designers, land designers and planners to help us with that, to address a lot of those things that Stephen was talking about. And then we have to validate those concepts with market research uh, to try to prove out if, if our suspicions are real. So once you have a site and you've validated the concept, then we need to determine, is the project financially feasible? And this is where we start by maybe preliminary negotiations with the, uh, uh, regarding the property acquisition. We spend some money on preliminary conceptual design. Believe it or not, we also spend some time evaluating the likelihood that the city that we're working in uh, anticipating what kind of support we might get from the municipality and the public in that area. I can tell you that cities vary greatly when it comes to the cost and the process of pursuing uh, entitlements and approvals. It's a function of time, it's attitude, it's the level of cooperativeness, the impact fees. You know, we have projects right now in 16 states and I, and I can tell you that by and large, developing in Utah is a pleasure. Uh, compared to some of our neighboring states and and uh, some on the coast, and uh, but but still even even within Utah, uh, we would tell you that some city, cities are easier to work with than others. So we, then we've got to start working on rough cost estimates for the uh, project. So we usually team up with a contractor, an estimator. We have to consider what financing, what banks would be interested in the project. And once we kind of have an idea of cost, what kind of financing is available, we're sifting down to what's the equity investment that's going to be required. And we have to determine the sources for that. Is this money we have in our own pocket? Are we going to syndicate a group of investors? 
And then we begin calculating a projected return on the cost, a return on the investment. And this is where we're constantly weighing the risk and the reward for uh, getting into a project. And I can tell you that there's a lot of time and money uh, spent just to get to this first de decision hurdle before we're, you're even decided whether or not the project is worth pursuing further. Presuming it is, then we jump into the due diligence phase. And now we're really trying to prove out the financial feasibility of the concept. At this point, we would likely enter into a contract for the land, and you're putting down earnest money, and, and then there's all the due diligence just related to the property, zoning, title, encumbrances, environmental conditions, property condition reports. We have to create our ownership structures, so we have a lot of legal fees involved in that. And this is the stage where we would engage uh, a design team and bring in the architects and engineers for a much more serious, uh, uh, you know, detail, level of detail. And, and this is all necessary to help us dial in further on the construction cost estimates. And this is probably where, even though we may have made inquiries with the cities, this is probably where we officially begin the process of working with the municipality and the public. And, uh, and, and that's the point where we're also uh, talking to potential lenders and investigating whether or not uh, there is TIF financing available for any portions of the improvement, tax increment financing. So at another step here, we're then re-evaluating the pro forma, that risk versus return. Again, we can easily spend more than a year and hundreds of thousands of dollars to this point, and we still may not know if it makes sense to move ahead and pursue the project. We refer to these as chase costs, and all of those uh, require a margin of development risk you know, built into the return profile. I would just tell you that developers have to have patience. Uh, if we go ahead with a project, we have to be prepared to wait months or even years to realize a return on our investment of capital and time and effort. And there are no guarantees. A project can be killed anywhere along the line for any number of reasons. Unexpected problems and challenges are inevitable with any project, and developers have to be prepared to deal with it. So to ob obtain project approvals, uh, you know, we have to be flexible and adaptable and every, every project, large or small, we know affects the community to some degree. You as public officials, community groups, neighbors, other stakeholders, everyone wants a voice in the project planning process and we get that. In order to win community support, we as developers have to have that ability to work with a variety of people communicate our vision for a project to address those key issues and seek solutions. So that's kind of a rundown of just what the process itself is. Just a thought or two on, on working with developers. I would uh, hope you will be open to considering new ideas and design concepts. You've heard a lot of them today uh, from the other presenters. The fact is we're growing. If we're talking about being along the Wasatch Front, we are land constrained. We're challenged by cost, and that's cost of land and, and construction cost. There is an unaffordability problem, and it's not just limited to housing. So that is what drives us to uh, considering higher density, possibly more vert higher vertical construction, smaller footprints, transportation components are important that have been referred to per Megan's uh, presentation. Um, another thing I would ask that uh, you as, as uh, uh, city officials and workers in that front is to have an understanding of tax increment financing and the ability to explain that to your citizens. We find that this is always misunderstood with the public and the media loves the sound bites. Why should we let greedy developers line their pockets with our hard-earned tax dollars? Um, the tax increment financing projects that we've been involved with, at least in Utah, they're almost always post-performance projects. The developer doesn't earn anything back unless he performs 
on what he's promised to do. The developer pays up front for public infrastructure, roads, uh, utilities, sewer, curb gutter and sidewalk, um, the things that, it, that inure to the benefit of the public, but then gets a chance to earn a portion of that back over a certain period of time, paid by a portion of the increase in the taxable value from the improved properties. Some of you may have seen a week or two ago in the enterprise, uh, Tom Westmoreland, the, the mayor of Eagle Mountain wrote a great article about economic development being the engine that drives everything. And he has a great paragraph or two in there about tax increment financing. I would just say that this is a great benefit available to municipalities in Utah that isn't available everywhere else. Just 30 days ago, I was up I was in Idaho at a meeting with uh, in a particular city and the city manager as we were trying to talk about how it might be possible to do a public private partnership or finance uh, a need that they have and want in their city he was bemoaning the fact that we don't have all the tools here that your cities in Utah have and uh, and that was the main thing that he was referring to the other thing i would just say and this isn't always easy but have the courage to defend the approved decisions that you make as a city and with the naysayers and just know that there always will be naysayers that's just how it is in the world we live in today and in closing uh, I would just say that if developers aren't coming to your city and you believe that your city has an unrecognized need uh, and demand for a compelling opportunity Take the matter into your own hands and evaluate the opportunity yourself. This is much about what Paul talked about, the city of Holiday. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, in, you know, hire the market feasibility studies yourself. Uh, look for the site availability. As, as Holiday said, they actually acquired parcels. Um, find a good site uh, and, and determine if you can acquire it if it's, if it's not property that the city already controls. Go ahead and work with conceptual uh, preliminary design, uh, land planners and architects, and get to a stage where you can go out and look for someone to come and do that project. I can say, I can tell you that we do this, we do this all the time. We respond to, we had a group yesterday in Kentucky that, where we'd been selected as, as the first choice of a developer for uh, a research park type of uh, development um, close to a university. But get to where you can put out a request for qualifications, where you get a chance to sift through the, the developers that you can pick and choose from, and then work that down to an RFP, a request for proposals. And if you have a concept that's well-conceived and financially promising, I can tell you that the developers will usually compete for that opportunity. Ari, right, that's what I had. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Randy. So we're gonna go to Q&A now. Um, we, we don't have a ton of time left. Uh, we may go over a little bit. So for those who can stick with us, uh, you can just keep right on listening. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask, actually, and this is gonna be directed towards Megan. Um, Megan, could you talk a little bit about the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program and how it can be a tool for cities who want to implement a center? Definitely, yeah. So I, I manage the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program, as Ari said. This is a Wasatch Front Regional Council administered program partnered with Salt Lake County, UDOT, and UTA. And the, the purpose of this program is to provide technical assistance funds um, or, or just technical assistance from Wasatch Front Regional Council staff to um, just help think through some of the issues. Maybe it's, it's planning the center um, maybe it's writing an ordinance for a center or even doing a market analysis or, you know, having conversations with property owners and, and developers in the community about a center. Um, and this is funding that is available to the Wasatch Front Regional Council area. There is um, also a kind of a sister program of, to the Transportation and Land Use Connection Program, which is administered by UDOT. This is in its going into its second year of funding, and that's called the Technical Planning Assistance Program. Um, a great person at UDOT to talk to about that is um, Jordan Backman. And um, I'm not sure who this question is from, but I'm happy to talk more 
offline about um, about this. I think, um, and there's also information on our website. All right, great. So that's a, a great place to look. You know, two places to look, I guess, if you're looking for technical assistance and and maybe even some planning funds. Um, so we we've gotten a couple of questions. One was about uh, do we just you know, if we're interested in a neighborhood center, do we just go change the zoning? And then we have had some questions about how does the public-private partnership work in some of these, like the Holiday Village Center. So kind of wanted to open that up to the panel. Let's let's say a city is interested in creating a mixed-use center. What what should the city be doing and what might the city's role be versus private developers? So I don't know if Paul or Randy, you want to launch into that or? I can, I can answer that a little bit, for, at least in our case. Um, you know, the first thing is obviously get a plan together and then decide, you know, what, how you're going to assemble property. Um, the city ended up owning a key piece of property um, in the village area, not just City Hall, but we, we bought that. We, we invested in that property uh, where the um, clock tower is. And when the Great Recession hit, everything shut down for a while. And so everybody was kind of waiting for something to happen. But we ended up working at a deal where um, we, in essence, exchanged that property. We gave that property to the developer if they would build a certain amount of development and build underground parking and, uh, and do certain things we needed to do. So it really jump-started the village. So we had this key piece of ground there, but um, needed something to happen with it. So we became a partner uh, on that property, and uh, we have some other development agreements on a couple of other pieces as well. So that's one thing you can do. Right. You want to add anything to that, Randy? Or? I'd just say that, yeah, you know, well-developed plans and concepts, they're awesome. But the one thing you have to remember is that costs are costs. And somewhere along the line, you know, some, somehow those costs have to be paid. And, uh, and um, depending on, uh, you know, what those are, I mean, th those are going to be the breaking points to decide whether a project actually goes forward or not. And, uh, you know, as long as the, a developer and a city can work together to find the, you know, way, we, as developers, we, we, we'll, we'll build as ornate, uh, you know, a, a fairyland or, a, you know, whatever you want uh, to work with you on. But, but costs are costs. And so there comes a point there that if, if rent, the, pr the proposed rents won't justify those costs in the marketplace, then there has to be another way to close that gap and cover it. But uh, th that's the only thing I would add to that. All right. Um, we had a question about how we transition from existing shopping centers into a mixed use center. And this, this seems particularly relevant as we shift to more online shopping and uh, we're probably going to see more and more brick and mortar stores struggling. And we've probably accelerated that trend with this COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I think I'll probably open that up to any one of you that wants to jump in. How, how would you go about transitioning an existing shopping center into something more mixed use and walkable? No, I don't want to hog the comments, but I can tell you our process in Orem, you know, uh, this was a, this was a shopping center built in the early 70s in typical mall format, you know, uh, what started out as a two anchor barbell that ended up a three anchor mall, uh, probably over retailed with shop space, but basically sitting on 120 acres that, that almost 70% of it was asphalt. And so, uh, you know, when we made the decision to, to really take on that project, uh, you know, it, it was it was a wide open slate on on what to do with all that land and uh, and I can tell you we're only halfway through you know we're only five or six years in through this process uh, with our redevelopment plan there but already it's fun to kind of go back and look at what the original land planning concepts were and how how different the the market the market will will help tell you you know what to do and where to do it and how to do it but it's it, it, so far we've been thrilled the fact that you know we've been able to bring in office we've been able to bring in a bunch of housing units we've brought we build a park you know there's a lot going on there and we're only part way through so let, those those are opportunities. Ari, can I um, jump in on this one? I, I uh, 
I think a lot of communities are grappling with the question of how do we ensure there is a lot of lively boutique retail in a center. And as uh, Michaela noted, one of the big challenges that, and you've noted, one of the big challenges we have is that retail demand is, for brick and mortar is declining. And um, I think uh, it also gets at one of the questions that was posed in the chat bar about different centers um, cannibalizing retail demand. I think uh, maybe a good initial step for a city is to get a ballpark sense of market demand. Have a market analysis done. Um, recognize that you can affect market demand somewhat. You can increase buying power through residential. Um, so it's not something that you can just take as a given, you can shape it. Uh, but I would suggest that in this day and age, uh, where markets are shifting, they're shifting for retail, they might be shifting for office. Um, it's maybe a good time to not try to over prescribe, proscribe land use and to have a very flexible stance with regard to land use. Well, if you have a flexible stance with regard to land use, then how do you have that vibrant, um, walkable feel? Um, and um, I'd love to get some of the other panelists' thoughts on this, but I think that you, you can require active uses on the ground floor. Um, and they can be uh, uh, a welcoming lobby with a lot of glass to a residential building. It can be a civic use. Uh, there's a variety of, it, it can be designed so that it can flex pretty easily to retail over time. Um, that kind of, those kind of design treatments. So design can enable that feel of activity and vitality, even if the use sort of comes and goes and you're not positive about the retail component of land use. Great. Uh, Ted, on that, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. We had some concern about uh, uh, retail versus residential on the ground floor, and I saw that in the chat. Um, we have kind of staked out an area in our village where you must have ground floor retail, whether it's restaurant or retail. It has to be active commercial, uh, simply because um, we, needed, we needed a return on investment. We needed cash registers. We needed people coming and buying things. If we hadn't done that, the prime areas of our downtown would have would have likely filled up, I think, on unquestionably with uh, offices and residential. We had several people say, "Gosh, I can build, I can build incredible residential anywhere in your village." Yes, yeah, of course you can because that's what's selling right now. Residential is always going to sell because we we have a shortage. But um, and and then in terms of return on investment, with such a small area that the Holiday Village is. We couldn't have the whole area in um, ground floor only retail, but we did stake out kind of a, the key areas around the plaza and the core that needed to be for people moving in and out, uh, you know, shopping, uh, dining, uh, visiting, uh, sitting on the plaza, uh, riding their bikes. And with, with residential and or office, you would have had a much slower kind of activity level, a lower activity level they're facing the street. So that was something that we specifically did. Great. Thank you to all of you. Um, we also had a question asking about uh, if you're a city that has a large transportation corridor, you know, a State Street, for example, or a Redwood Road, um, how do you deal with that when you're building a center? You know, I, I would love to jump in at least for starters, and I know that there's a lot of thoughts on this one, but let me say the very first thing, which is that uh, UDOT uh, wants to work with communities. Um, but the first thing in working with UDOT on a road that they have, that they own, is you need to clearly articulate your desires as a city. You've got to start by having a really well articulated general plan. You can't go in for a conversation with UDOT and just say, we're talking about doing this or that, um, have your vision clearly articulated, and then sit down and talk with your region planner. Every region of UDOT 
has a planner um, and their, their purpose is among other things to work with communities and help them think about how can we work for the win-win, right? So UDOT has um, people moving desires. I worded it that way purposefully, not just car moving. Um, that is the new UDOT, um, but they do care about the car portion of that. Um, and um, there are ways I think that we can explore together getting to that spot where can we help create placemaking together with, uh, with meeting uh, mobility needs. I wanna put double down on what Ted said. I think that that's a really good message. Um, somewhat, somewhat different from that. We've, we're seeing a few examples locally and definitely um, plenty outside of Utah where um, you know, cities are recognizing maybe what some of their corridors are best at and, and maybe that is moving cars and, and they're turning to a nearby block or maybe a, a new connection within a block that doesn't exist yet and creating an extremely walkable environment um, just one street over that's served by regional transportation. Um, but once you're in a, what may have been an abandoned alley or a, um, might be a new connection, um, you, there's the opportunity to create um, a brand new walkable experience. So I think there's definitely, there's multiple creative approaches. Um, when I think when we think of the center of our city, it's, it's usually on a major thoroughfare. All right. Yeah. So maybe, maybe the thoroughfare is next to the center instead of through the middle, I guess is the point. Yeah. Interesting point. Um, let's see. Um, when, when we polled people on the barriers, um, the lack of political will and nimbyism kind of came up high. Um, do you guys have any advice for cities for dealing with the public and communicating with the public, engaging with them to, um, to build the buy-in to this, these kinds of places? I'd love to hear Paul's advice on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I will, I will say this. Um, Holiday was truly blessed back in the day with its early leaders, its early planning commissioners and council members. Uh, when, they, when they coordinated, when they did their general plan, they definitely talked about revitalization of their downtown. And that really set the stage for things to come uh, in the years that followed, including the Great Recession. So, uh, you know, when we became a city in, in, in ostensibly early to late 99, we wanted to start building the village right away. And we developed our village zone and regulations in 04, and then we revised them in 05, 06, and 07. And, you know, until something got built, people weren't really opposed to the village. Um, and most people have been supportive of the village, but you'd be surprised how uh, there's a real fear that no matter how successful our village has been, some of our big, biggest critics have been uh, right on the periphery of the village. And so they moved to kind of a decrepit downtown. We build this really nice village. We get rave reviews. People from all over want to come and visit it. And the second we build a building that follows our plan, the residents come out and storm the citadel, if you will, and say, that building's too tall. And one of the real problems with building a village is you have to have some verticality. You, you can't do a one story village. It just doesn't work. You gotta have some presence and that verticality with the buildings gives you some presence. And frankly, I've been a little disappointed that we haven't gone a little taller with our main buildings. We've allowed up to 48 feet until recently, but one project we built back behind Harmon's generated such heat from the neighborhood that we actually reduced our height and re reduced our density. Our housing density used to be unlimited. It used to be limited just based on height and, and parking. And so we had these natural limits on height and parking. But the net residents came out and the council said, Paul, we want, we want to reduce the height and we want to reduce the density. And so it's been very hard. Uh, you have to stay the course. And even when you've got success, I can tell you, it has been an uphill battle. We had a general plan amendment. We have a general plan amendment being proposed for next week, a week from tonight, that is going to propose that we take an area out for higher density right on the edge of our village 
uh, because of an unpopular rezone that occurred a few months ago. And even with everything that's happened, I can tell you, it's, it, 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 it's so easy to make a mistake and walk back from the success you've had. So I gotta tell you, you uh, I, I'll tell you this much. Um, I have come close to quitting over a couple of decisions in the last six months. That, that, I felt that passionate about a couple of decisions that were made to just say, you've done all these great things and now you're going backwards. I just can't stand this anymore. We, we lucked out when the uh, Apollo burger didn't, didn't stay here because you see what you're going to get. A developer came in, bought the Apollo burger site, bought a car wash next door, and now is going with a much bigger, more significant development, which will only lend itself to the vision of what centers can do. But it's so easy to make mistakes. And you, your planning staff and your planning commission, you have to have a champion. And if it takes, if it takes developing one internally as your staff or developing one on your planning commission, you've got to, you've got to develop people who are going to rah-rah and cheer for your village or your center because it can easily start to go south the first time something goes up that somebody says is too big and kids are going to get run over, you know, all the cliches, oh, all these bad things are going to happen, which they never do. So I'm, I'm blabbling on and on, but I could write a book about just the experience here in Holiday and how, how co close we've come to losing uh, the edge on a great village that's been built. So we're, it looks like Ted wants to add something. And I think we're, we may wrap it up after that. Okay. And I, I uh, I think Paul alluded to this. Um, there is no simple thing, but I'm going to try to make it a little simpler, which is that um, I, I, I think the extent, the, the extent to which you look at centers in your city, citywide, the politics tends to be broader and more balanced than if, if you just go in piece by piece and think about um, zoning, then the politics tend to be NIMBY driven only. Now, NIMBYs are people too, but you should have a citywide conversation and then and look long term and then you can think about purposefully what are the pros and cons of this centered pattern of development. And I think that that citywide look is, gives you a good chance to balance those voices. Um, and then once you have the citywide vision, you got to move to implementation while you have momentum. And that's just a, two quick things I would mention. So um, I'm going to give you one more question because we got it in the Q and A and we got it in the in the chat. Um, you know, it came up a little bit in the discussion here about uh, the requirement for ground floor retail. Um, so we have a question about uh, uh, developers not liking that requirement um, and uh, also not liking uh, vertical mixed use in general within a building. Um, what what advice would you give a city? There are, I, you know, I'll, oh, go ahead, Randy. No, I, I was just going to say, having spent 30 of my years in, uh, in my career in property management, you know, the only reluctance to, to mixed use managing it is just it brings another level of, of complexity, you know. Is, is it great living right above a restaurant? When are deliveries made? When is the garbage emptied? But, you know, it's, 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 it takes a lot more coordination. But it can be done, and it can, and it can be, it can be beautiful, and and it can be awesome. I think, from the other standpoint, you know, just the requirement of of retail on the ground floor uh, is okay, but you know, what what will those spaces actually draw, and will a tenant be able to be successful there? Again, it kind of comes back to cost. The rent you're going to have to have to justify the development cost, and and you know how how many uh, coffee shops and hair salons and stuff like that uh, can you have? You know, general soft goods stores are not likely to locate in a place like that. They're mostly service oriented or knickknacky type of stuff. So it's just it's just not easy. You know, it's just not it's not for the faint of heart. You know, whether you're on the city side or whether you're on the developer side. Randy, I think that that's a really good perspective. And I like that you brought up, you know, hair salons and coffee shops, um, because so often when we talk about retail, I think people, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for many people is, is shopping. 
Um, and that's what, you know, we discussed earlier is, um, is not as certain as, you know, you, there's not a really great online supplement for a hair salon. Um, I think I've tried you, you want to go to the hair salon. So there, there are things that are going to be more secure than others. Another thing I, I wanted to bring up is it's, it's not a silver bullet because, um, you know, the, the market, the market is kind of rules all here, but there are things you can put requirements you can put into your ordinances that, at, that at least require that the space be able to be used for retail or for a use other than residential in the future. You know, something that might be as simple as a little extra insulation um, and a few more feet of height on the ground floor might be the difference between never having that space be tr able to transition and, you know, maybe being able to get a, a boutique in there or something in there one day if it's not Great. viable now. Great comments, Megan. Can I go back to the retail thing? Um, we, sure. it, we include services as retail. So um, a spa, uh, musical lessons. Uh, we have a London School of Music in our downtown area. They came in, they, we had, a, we had a, a real estate office that wanted to expand through onto one of our streets that says no, no for ground floor office. So we had a, a music school come in and we said, you know, as long as you offer items for sale in there, you can have lessons and you can set up rooms for rehearsals and those kinds of things, but you gotta have some active sales going on. You gotta have a cash register. Uh, right now, one of the buildings that I showed tonight is an old, or this afternoon is an old bike shop that's been vacated. And we've got somebody who wants to come in there and uh, they're not gonna have as much retail as the previous guys did, but they will. So um, we're saying that's okay. You want to have meeting space, you want to have office space, maybe even some storage space, but you've got to have a retail component in those areas where we say it's ground floor. We also do allow for ground floor uh, lobby areas for upstairs residential. So you can have residential, uh, not on the ground floor, but you can have an entryway to go upstairs. So we, we do have some flexibility, but ours is such a small area that we, we had to draw the line on a couple of spots, but we get this question all the time about what is retail. So a spa, we have a hair salon right on our plaza. We say all the stuff that they sell is okay. Um, you know, the scissors and the lotions and all those kinds of things they sell in terms of their services. So you have to have some flexibility. All right. So um, we're over time. We're going to wrap up. I, I'm going to give, uh, you know, Stephen James had to run somewhere else, but I'm going to give each one of the four of you a uh, one sentence concluding thought. If you had one sentence that participants should remember as they're thinking about centers. So who wants to go first? I will. All right, go for uh, it, Paul. Okay. Uh, have a plan. Stick to it. Have a plan. Stick to it. All right, Ted. Uh, in this day and age, it's never been more important to have a city that is livable and lovable. That's the key to a great economy. Livable and lovable city. All right, who's next? I'll, I'll just say that uh, you know, it is possible to have a very open, transparent, um, you know, good working relationship between developers and cities. And uh, it doesn't have to be antagonistic, so aim for that. It can be done, and it and it's a it's a great experience when that happens. The, the public-private partnership. All right, yeah. Megan, you're last. I think I wouldn't be the technical assistance fairy if I didn't say we're here to help. Um, there's every situation is so different, and there are programs out there um, and professionals out there that really want to help you figure it out. Great. Thanks, everybody. This, this was great. And as I mentioned before, it's uh, recorded. It'll be available. Share it with other people who would be interested. And, and once again, uh, thanks to our sponsors, Daybreak Communities and Rocky Mountain Power. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ari. Thank you.